Maybe 1% of the holder base actually gets out over 3x on that coin. What was the probability of success? Extremely low. You can't just go, oh yeah, this guy 100x my money, so now it's my turn to try it. It's like, bro, that was one guy out of 10,000. Like, good luck with figuring that one out. And you have to remember that frame is only also one position. And so even if you're 100x, it doesn't actually mean that he 100x his net worth. It could be a percentage. And so you really have to look at it holistically from the view of what is the most simple and sufficient process. Sad reality is that most people watching this aren't and will never be investors. They will just perpetually stay as gamblers. And you have to ask yourself, why do people who love 100x coins not have money? They exactly. don't have money because yeah. they're chasing the 100x, not because they don't have money and they're chasing the 100x. Exactly. It's because they could make 100x, but then tomorrow they could lose it all as well. You have to multiply the probability of your decisions across a 20-year period. And the answer to those people is it's always zero. Thank you guys for joining this video. Today, I'm here with I guess you would say 0x Kun. Is that how you say it? Is that correct? Uh, 0x Kun. Yeah, Kun. Or just Kun for sure. Yeah. So for context, guys, this is one of my favorite investors on crypto Twitter. This guy, you should be following him. His insights into the market are like actually like insane. Like what he says, every time I read one of his tweets, I'm like, this guy just said exactly what, I, what I've been thinking. Just He just put it better than me. So today we're going to be doing an investing masterclass. We're going to be going over how you can get prepared for the next bull run. We're going to be going over the ETF, what that means for the market, and just some like general investing mindset sort of processes that you all need to be following because Kun approaches crypto investing incredibly professionally. And it's something that you very rarely see on online. Most people, when they come to crypto, they're gambling. They don't take it very seriously. They've got no strategy, no process. They don't really know what they're actually doing. And so we want to make this video to give you an exact understanding of how you should actually be approaching investing properly with a proper strategy. And yeah, we're going to be going into this in a lot of depth today. So I think to start off, it would be really good if we had an introduction from you, Kun. So maybe give us some background on how, like, how you got into crypto, how long you've been in the space for, how have you done so far? And yeah, like a bit, bit of stuff like that would be good. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dan. And thanks for having me. Um, you know, I'm a fan of yours and I like people that are actually trying to teach people how to invest as opposed to just pick. So um, thanks for having me on. So yeah, I'm a 0x underscore Kuhn on Twitter. Um, I've been in crypto from about 2015. And my background's actually in software startups. So it was kind of like a natural leaning into um, crypto being at the front end, like cybersecurity um, in AI. And so um, that's how I sort of um, first got into tech and then into crypto. Um, I've always been interested in investing. So before investing in crypto, I've been investing in um, the stock market, particularly tech stocks. And so that gave me a great view into, um, you know, hype cycles when, um, you know, when crypto protocols, they say they're partnering with AWS, but really what they mean is they're using their compute platform. And so it just gave me a natural edge at the start. And so, um, yeah, that's, so that's how I kind of got into um, crypto. I think one of the most popular talking points on Twitter right now is the ETF. And everyone has a different take on what the ETF means for crypto. And I saw a tweet that you put out and you talked about the ETF in a really positive light. And I wanted to get your more in-depth breakdown on why you think the ETF is good for crypto and like what you what is your take on the entire ETF story? Yeah, sure. So I think the ETF is actually positive in terms of the three different um, groups of um, people or buyers that will come into the market. Um, at first, it's people that actually believe in the crypto space. They might own a little bit of Bitcoin. Maybe they don't. They always kind of thought, you know, Bitcoin could happen, but they didn't 100% believe of it. And now that they're seeing that the BT, uh, Bitcoin ETF is coming out, they're actually thinking, oh, you know what? This has actually been talked about for a long time, but it's actually happening. So they're doubling down. Um, the second group of people that um, it, it's going to on board is after FTX happened and all these, you know, a couple of bear markets have happened, like most people right now, like apart from people on CT, think that crypto is still is a scam. They're going to wake up the day when BTF is uh, Bitcoin ETF is approved. They're going to check the news and they're going to look at the price of Bitcoin because they haven't been checking. And they're going to notice that it's already up um, and that the CEO of BlackRock is talking about it in comparison to gold as a safe haven asset. And then they're going to get interested again. And so... Um, 
I think that's going to be huge. But the third one is where the huge upside is. And it's actually to people that don't even care about Bitcoin who still won't follow Bitcoin because the same way that there's like a passive bid in the stock market due to mutual funds, retirement accounts, once the ETF's approved and actually live, you're going to have like 0.5%, 1% of, you know, um, different mutual funds, retirement accounts, buying Bitcoin in ETFs. And so that seven-year-old guy, that 40-year-old woman that you see at the shops that don't even know anything about crypto, they're going to own Bitcoin. And so that across the next, you know, two, three, five, 10 years is going to be a passive 200, three, four, five, six hundred billion dollar bid that is just passively coming into that market. And so that's what's really exciting. I just want to caveat and say that there is going to be a gap, I think, um, between when the um, ETF gets approved um, and the time it takes from there to actually um, for the for the ETF to come online. But having said that, we've also got, you know, harvening talks, um, so yeah, but but um, but as a long term investor, um, yeah, it, it's um, very positive. I, in my view. I fully agree. By the way, and I actually was thinking this. I had this like insight last week, and it's that concept of in the stock market when all this new money is created, a you know significant percent of that inevitably flows into stocks. So if there's more inflation, more money goes into stocks. If there's less inflation, like there's still money going into stocks. There's that passive bid that we talk about. And crypto, because the onboarding is broken, that amount of money that is created that ends up in the crypto space is only very, very small because it's very difficult to get money into the space. And most people think it's a scam. And because yields are high, most of the money that's created is still just going back into collecting that 3 5%. And so, uh, like you said, with the ETF, it unlocks a passive bid. The amount of money that is created that will now be going into crypto is going to maybe 5 10x, whatever the number is, from the amount that was passively going to flow in beforehand. It sort of like unlocks like the, the floodgates for a larger amount of passive bid to come into the market. Do you think that this passive bid is going to change the the markets, the four-year cycle nature of crypto? Do you think it's going to make crypto trade more like like the stock market, for example? Like where it's well, like, more, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. And, and I think that um, Bitcoin's already separated itself from molten cycles. Like obviously each cycle, it's the highs and lows have been closer together. Um, and so I, I think that um, it will become steadier um, as we go on because this, I give this um, example of like, you see what happens even for, you know, people that just deal with old coins when an, um, an old is released on Ethereum that, um, that used to be on Solana or something and it goes up 5, 10x. And that's from people just not being, it can't be bothered to bridge. This, this passive bid, we're not just talking about um, inflation um, or like people putting in a bit of extra money. We're just talking about people that have, um, you know, in many countries that have, you know, superannuation or retirement accounts, they're not even having to do anything. That money is just constantly getting added um, into the market. And so it'll create a lot more steady, um, a lot more steady inflows. Um, and the type of buyers that are coming into the market um, because of the nature of where that money sits, the sell side is also going to be um, lower than than um, than current. So I definitely think that over time it will um, steady um, and and be more of a uh, a steadier um, growth um, than than it is currently. Yeah, because if you view the if you look at the type of mindset that a stock investor has and and the way that they invest their money it's very different from the mindset and the method that people invest their money into crypto and the same person can have money in stocks and money in crypto but they can have an entirely different mindset for both allocations of money like when i talk to people who invest in crypto they view crypto as the degen bucket and because they view it as the degen bucket they take it with a totally different approach it's much more about making money and then taking it out you know, it's like quick profits. It's like you, you're trying to dump on other people. 
you really view it as a zero sum game where I feel like the stock market, it's a very different approach with the money that you put in there. It's more of like a three, three. It's like, if we all hold this and we never sell, we can all make money because it will just go up forever. It's like a three, three mindset, I feel like in stocks. And what I see, it sounds like what you're trying to say is that this stock mindset of less selling and more just holding for the long term, it's going to change the type of buyer that enters crypto and obviously the type of holder that ends up holding crypto. Obviously, there's the Bitcoin people who've been holding it for 10 years plus and they are just the, the never sell type of people. But it sounds like we're going to get more of that type of person enter the market. Would you Would you agree? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I think that kind of 3-3 mindset is going to come um, first for Bitcoin um, and then we'll see how adoption goes and things go for mm. other crypto as well. Do you have any thoughts on a, an Ethereum ETF? Do you think it's going to be a bit trickier to get an approval there? Uh, obviously, we're not, we don't want any predictions on like timeline, but um, do you, can you see a future where an ETH ETF gets approved or do you think it's, it's, too, it's too, uh, too risky? Yeah, look, I'm I'm not an ex expert in that, so I don't want to make a, a comment as to whether I you know think yes or no. But I I do think that off the back of the BTF BTC ETF approval um, speculation that the Ethereum ETF would get approved, um, plus because of previous market cycles, is going to bring back um, a lot of interest and 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 um, into Ethereum, and that would cause um, you know, potentially price to go higher shortly after that as well. But yeah, as far as when the ETF would get approved for ETH, um, you know, I, I have no idea. Yeah, it's, the prediction side of things is anyone's guess. I try to avoid predictions as well. So, okay, so now we know Bitcoin ETF, it's a very positive catalyst for crypto. What is your actual strategy that you implement for crypto? Because I actually don't fully know this one as well. And I'm actually not even sure if you'd want to share it. But I'd be curious yeah. to know, and I'm sure the listeners would be as well, if you had a breakdown of like how you're approaching crypto, not as much about like coin picking, but like, yeah. you know, like a more strategy side of things. Yeah, well, I always say picks don't matter. Um, and um, the, the main thing to start off with is regardless of what you're investing in, the number one principle you always got to start with is um, you've got to, um, you've got to invest with belief that you're right, but position like you could be wrong. And so um, what I mean by that and um, is when I invest in crypto, I start off with the premise of, okay, is there a world where um, Bitcoin fails? I mean, it's possible. So then you go down the line. Is there a world where Bitcoin fails and ETH also fails? Who knows? That might be possible. Then you have to say, well, okay, if, if, if crypto failed, is it possible that gold also fails? I don't think so. And so then I would say, put, I would put my like retirement account all in gold, gold miners, um, stock. And then I would use that as a backdrop for, um, my position before I even start my crypto positions. And the important thing about positioning as if you could be wrong is that, um, when the market does test you, you need to be able to make sure that you've thought about all scenarios before you even start. Um, too many people in crypto and investing in general, they only ever think about the upside. Um, but you have to think about the downside um, before you think about upside. And so once you start that thought process, that starts to lead to everything that you need to know. Um, because then you start thinking about, okay, well, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? If I had half my net worth in this and it dropped 20%, would I be able to sleep at night? No, I wouldn't. Okay, so what percentage would make sense? And then you you think through this over and over um, until you get to a point where you've thought about the risk. Um, and I say that it's like, um, you know, managing a soccer team or if you call it football, that, um, you know, risk is managed in the game. You You always have a goalie. You always have defense. You don't have your strike you don't have 10 strikers on the field and then swap them off for 10 goalies once the market drops so you have to think about this all, all this stuff up front and and too many people think about it as um you know they, they only think about the upside and they think oh i'll manage the risk later but mm -hmm. um in reality you know all the risk is up front and all the returns are in the end so um i think you know i don't know if that's a bit of a waffly answer but you've always got to start from that premise 
Um, and then kind of like, um, you know, uh, you really need to focus on your, and, and so that leads to kind of focusing on your strengths and covering your weaknesses. So there's no one, I don't think there's just any one way to do it. Um, if you're, for example, um, you know, looking at, you know, the quality of chefs, if you're not able to cook Michelin star food, there's no point trying to cook, you know, um, some fancy ass dish. Just master how to put salt and pepper on the, you know, steak and 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 start there. And then, you know, develop your skills, um, improve on your weaknesses. Um, but yeah, yep. people just try to go from zero to zero to zero to one hundred, and and that's what causes a lot of mistakes. Yep the 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 metaphor I use is. Too many people try to perform heart surgery when they could barely even put a Band-Aid on a wound. Like people come into crypto and they try to be like a day trader or some like high like level skill where you literally would have to be a heart surgeon level of skill to even be able to make money from it. And they don't even have the ability to just purely buy low, invest, hold, and then sell. Like they don't even have the basic fundamental skills of just putting a Band-Aid on. And so, yeah, I, I agree. When you come into the market, people try to go super advanced too early and they also forget that most of the money it comes from just being able to put a band-aid on a wound like it just most of the money comes from you just buying low holding through the course of a bull run and then you know selling towards the top and this is how most of the guys who trade on twitter make most of their gains as well it's it's all the things that they did which they didn't really do anything for which made them most of the money and trading was always just this little thing that gave them a little boost like they they focus like 80% 80% of their time on the thing that makes them only 20% of the money. It's very interesting. And um, so linking this back to what you've said, you talk about the importance of fully analyzing the situation, the downside, the upside before you actually make an investment. So that even if price goes down, you know exactly why, why it's doing that because you've already pre-planned for it. So you've analyzed the chessboard of this bull run. You've seen what you think is going to go good or bad. You see the downside, the upside. What do you like? What's what's your strategy? Like, how do you approach the market now? Like, how do you know when to buy, and how are you knowing when to sell? And what's like, when are you looking to buy, and when are you looking to sell? For example, in your strategy. Yeah. So the most important thing, um, yeah, for that, in in my opinion, is that you always need to consider asymmetric upside. Like, so what does it mean for um, you know downside to be less? You know, than upside. It, it really means that the opportunity is asymmetric, that the, you know, the downside might be 20, 30%, but that the upside is 10, 20 X. So that's the kind of opportunity profile that I would want to look at. Now, what I would recommend personally based on um, my own skill set or my own um, view is to have, you know, 70, 80% of your position in, in Bitcoin ETH. Um, and then have, you know, five or six, um, you know, bets in alts, if, if that's what you want to do so that any single position, it will hurt if you lose it. But at the same time, um, if it pays off, it, it's going to be, um, life changing because it's not, it's not about, um, you know, are you going to lose? Like we're all going to lose, you know, if you pick, five different opportunities, you know, three, four, they may um, go down 20, 30%, they may go to zero, but it's it's not how many loses, it's the size of your winners against the losses. And so um, that, that's why I think that's so important. Mm-hmm. I have a, I have a, I, have, I made a graphic of explaining that concept of it's not about um, like, cause in, in investing without an edge, you're going to lose as much as you, as you make, it's even. And your ability to make profit is your ability to, to raise the, to, to limit the amount of losses while also keeping the same downside. That's like it, you limit your losses so that you're able to um, like lose like only a small amount so that the profits are more than the losses in a sense. So um, personally, my strategy for crypto is I have, a, I have systems which basically determine when the price is dur- like during some sort of capitulatory level crash, some sort of like, um, you know, like, macro COVID sort of level fear, my, my like data sets basically try to detect this. And then we look for entries there. And then on the upside, my, my process is basically tr- waiting for that final eighth where we feel like we're in the final eighth 
of a bull run and then implementing a dollar cost average out sell strategy. That's my strategy. I don't know if you want to talk about what yours is for this bull run um, or if you'd prefer to avoid that. (laughs) No, no, no. I, I think what's important is that people definitely not try to play the game of I need to buy the all-time low and then I need to sell the all-time high because it's just not going to happen. So like you said, you want to be in kind of the right order of magnitude, right? As opposed to trying to come to top. What a lot of people don't consider, especially in alts, is that if you look back at any of the charts where things that did do 20, 50, 100 X, they, they all look like Eiffel Towers. Like if you did not get out within two weeks of the top, you basically are down 60, 70% off the all-time high. Um, And without a process in terms of how you're going to do that, and that's why I think it's good that you have that process, without that kind of process, when it does drop in two weeks, people are just going to think it's a deal, you know, like it's all good. And that's why why most people end up round tripping um, and, and, you know, going down 90% from all-time highs. And so you need to have based on um yeah your portfolio your goals um you know what is um your exit strategy and and plan that um plan that up front mm-hmm. yeah so um yeah, yeah and that's going to be different for everyone and so yeah uh, mm-hmm. it's, 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 that's very personal to each person yeah this is why alts are tricky because the margin for error is significantly larger Right. Like when Bitcoin tops, like you said, the, the range where you're going to sell is probably a lot smaller. The range of the volatility is probably a lot smaller than some tiny altcoin that just went 100x. So, like you said, you have to have your altcoin outperform Bitcoin at least 3x because you're never going to sell an exact top. You have to account for that margin of error where there's just so much more volatility. You're probably going to sell it after it's gone down 60 percent. And um, exactly. yeah, that's a really good point. And now, without, without a doubt, you're going to have people commenting or saying to you that Dan, Bitcoin and ETH just don't have the upside that alts do. And um, that's true from a um, a literal kind of like you're looking at a chart and from all time low to all time high. Yes, like without a doubt, alts are going to. But if you look at the reality of investing the process in which you actually have to put money in the market and take the money out of the market and actually realize profit. It's just not, it's just not founded in reality because, um, you know, in the middle of a bull market, they'll say, Oh, I've outperformed BTC ETH by 20 X. And then two years later, you never see them again because they're now down 95% and they got no money. And so you got to look at what is holistically the best strategy for the highest return over a longer period of time than just, you know, six to 12 months. And, uh, you know, you can either learn that, um, you know, the hard way or, you know, you can, you can learn it, um, you know, by seeing, you know, what, what um, the people that have survived and made a lot of money in this space have done. Yep. People love to use hindsight bias to say that they would be able to buy the, that bottom and sell that top. And they measure the amount that they'd make measuring the exact bottom to the exact top as if they'd be able to in the future predict that same thing when in reality they can't. And the reality with investing is even if you sell near the top, the fact that it was near the top and not the exact top means that there's a period of time where that decision will feel wrong. You will sell and then price will go up above your entry, ab- above your exit. So maybe there's uh, maybe there's 100 hours where the price goes up 30% from where you sold. And that 100-hour period, you're going to feel like you made the wrong decision. And that's why that process is really important because if you don't have a proper process, you will view that 100 hours where price is above your exit and you will go, oh shit, maybe I made the wrong decision. It's time to get back in. You'll buy back in. And actually that was the top. It was just a 100-hour delay from your exit. And you actually did time it quite well, but because you don't have a process, you fucked it up, right? Really, yeah, exactly. And realistically, if something 100x, then from all time low to all time high, you're doing well if you get about 15 x's out of that. Because yeah. if something was trending at 10, it, it momentarily hit one dollar and went to 100. You'd be lucky if you bought that at you know five to ten dollars and then got out at you know 70, 80. But to do that, that's why I think for each thing that you buy, you should always have a thesis. Why am I actually buying this? And what are the the reasons that um, are going to um, cause an increase in users, increase adoption, and people say that's all the mean. But if you don't have that thesis up front, 
and you let the market dictate when you're going to sell, you just don't sell because there's always, oh, this is coming and that's coming or, you know, I'm sorry, we didn't deliver on this, but, you know, this is coming. And so your, your decision on when to buy or sell should be independent of the price, actually. It should be based on you buy for a thesis and you sell when your thesis is met or you sell when your thesis um, um, fails. And so it, it gives you an independent um, entry and exit outside of just the price because the price is just the price and you're not going to be able to, um, you know, get in or out based on that. Mm-hmm. And too many people, I feel like, focus on how much money they can make and they don't focus enough on the actual probability of what you're trying to do, like to actually being successful. They will look at the guy who 100x his portfolio on, you know, buying the bottom, selling the top, and they will go, oh, I need to make that return. But they won't look at the probability of that scenario actually occurring successfully. That was one guy out of 100,000 people who actually hold the coin. And most people who hold the coin will lose money. So maybe one percent of the maybe one percent of the holder base actually gets out with over three x on that coin, and only one or two guys maybe got that one hundred x. What was the probability of success? Ex- extremely low. What's the probability of success of a you know a two to five x on Bitcoin or Ethereum buying it? You know during the bear market when you can tell that we're in that capitulatory area and then selling it towards the end of the bull run. That probability that you can succeed there is way higher. And yes, the returns are lower, but you have to account for the probability, the amount of returns, and also like previous success of implementing this strategy. Like you have to consider like multiple factors in in the decision. You can't just go, oh yeah, this guy 100x my money. So now it's my turn to try it. It's like, bro, that was one guy out of 10,000. Like good luck with figuring that one out. And you have to remember that frame is only also one position. And so even if you're 100x, that it doesn't actually mean that he 100x his net worth. It could be a, 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 you know, a percentage. And so you really have to look at it holistically from the view of what is the most um, simple and sufficient process in the way that I'm going to increase my total net worth um, and not some kind of process and just trying to find picks that you think are going to 100x. So it's... um. Yeah, it, it requires a holistic approach. So, how do you handle volatility in crypto? Like, if you if you enter, and let's say you're looking back in time, you bought here, price had to go down twenty percent before it went up, you know, one hundred percent. How do you mm-hmm. handle that volatility in your investment process? Um, because obviously, you're never going to buy a bottom. There's going to be periods where you lose. Losing isn't bad. That's just an impermanent loss. So, like, can you cover that for me? That topic. Sure. So I think volatility is the price that we pay, um, especially in crypto, to be able to make life-changing money in, in um, a shorter period of time. So you have to be very comfortable with volatility. You can trade, um, you know, you can work really hard for 40 years and you're trading, you know, your, your labor Um or you can trade um, in business, you're leveraging capital, you're leveraging your mind. Um, but one of the biggest assets in crypto is being able to d- deal with volatility. And that is the psychological cost of making it in crypto. Um, and so when you look at, um, you know, like you mentioned, like 20% down, people get too caught up on that. But there's a big difference between volatility and permanent loss of money. Volatility just means that between point A and B, the price fluctuated. Um, permanent loss of capital is it went down and then obviously went to zero. So you have to consider those two things um, separately because volatility in itself is not a risk. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so when 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 people talk about like oh I'm gonna I'm gonna um, oh I've got a good buy but like I think it's gonna drop twenty percent so I'm gonna sell it I'm gonna try buy lower. <laughs> They don't realize how much complexity that they're introducing. Um, like, firstly, you've got to consider, you know, um, uh, taxes and all that. But more important, there's three different things. Like, okay, I sell and it drops. Like, okay, are you going to buy 10% cheaper, 30% cheaper? At what price are you going to buy? Um, you know, the, the second thing is like, okay, but what if, um, what if it doesn't hit that price? Um, you know, what if, um, the price moves the other way at what price are you going to buy back in? Um, and so there's just so many different things that happen. Like if you go back and look at Facebook, 
you know, Amazon and Apple, they all, if you look at the chart, those little dips in volatility are an absolute glimpse on the chart. All you had to do was buy um, and, and basically, um, you know, hold. So, yeah, my view on volatility is that it's it's necessary um, and um, that's that's how wealth is made. If, if there's no volatility, then um, the ability to make a lot of money over, over shorter periods of time is... Um, diminished mm -hmm. it's very true and um the, the other issue with selling to buy lower is that when you have that thought in your brain that thought in your brain appears at the time when it is the worst time to sell to buy lower like you never think i should sell this to buy lower when the price is going up the only time that thought ever enters your brain is near the bottom so like <laughs> like people people have it wrong like when like right now i bet you no one's thinking oh i should sell this to buy lower like everyone's thinking, oh shit, like I should keep holding this. It could go higher, beginning of the bull run. You know, it might actually have worked now. Not that you should do it now, but it might have actually worked now. People think about when people have ideas to do things in the market, it's usually the wrong time because you should never, you should never listen to that first idea that your brain is telling you because it's telling you this idea based on a feeling that you're having. And the feeling that you're having is the same feeling that every single person in the market is feeling. And if everyone in the market is feeling the same thing, it's the wrong emotion to feel I, because you must counter trade the herd. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I totally agree with you. And that's why I tell people, like, if you're an investor, you should still know a little bit about trading and charts. And if you're a trader, you should still know a little bit about investing because what happens is that when investors think, oh, um, it's going to go lower, they don't realize that they're actually getting very bearish um, at, at support. Um, and they don't realize um, they're getting very bullish, you know, at resistance. And so they're, they're um, like just basic charting and understanding a, a bit of trading would, would help people understand that. But like because people have no process, they're purely going in based on their emotions. Um, the market is always going to figure out away between A to B from a low price to a higher price for other buyers to come in. There also needs to be sellers. So the market is going to do everything it can to make you exit from your position. Um, it's going to do, it's going to go up, you know, 50% in a day to try shake some people out. It's going to go, you know, um, sideways for seven months to, to get people out who are um, impatient. It'll do everything. And so you have to think about all this up front. Mm -hmm. And this is why I recommend the people to to not be looking at charts all day and to, to keep busy. Because if you are focused on making money, it's a lot easier to weather the storm of the volatility. Because like you say on your tweets, you should be doing nine, you should be doing nothing like 90% of the time. You should just be letting the position play out. It's very hard to let a position play out if you have nothing to do. Because then you're just going to sit at home, look at the charts all day. You're going to be hyper-analyzing, oh, I made $100 today. Oh, shit, price is dropping. If the people who make the most money tend to actually spend the least amount of time looking at their positions. They just bought Bitcoin. Like the guys who made the most money, not that they, you should do this, they basically bought it at like 10 bucks and they literally forgot it existed. It just was left there. And you shouldn't do that. But it's like from what I've seen, the best approach is that you need to keep yourself busy, focused on things that are important so that you can allow that 90% of the time where you do nothing to take place. Exactly. And, and what you are doing in that time and, and why I recommend um, less position is all you're doing is you're staying up to date with, is this tracking along with my thesis? And that thesis is should not be linked to whether the price, ups or, price is up or down. It should be just tracking to your thesis. Um, and that's what you're checking. Um, and so you, your portfolio should only be as big as that you can manage and always be up to date um, with what you're invested in. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, this whole, um, you know, kick 50 coins and then um, you, you just like at some point it'll look great because you'll have this screenshot, you know, that you're showing um, you're showing your friends. But like that's never the amount of money you're going to have. So, yeah. What do you think of like spread betting? Like those dudes who buy like 30 coins and they're basically just like they're trying to be like a VC. They're trying to plant a bunch of seeds and hopefully one of them takes off. Like why do you why do you believe that VCs? Allocating to thirty new new companies can do that strategy, but but people in crypto can't do it for thirty different altcoins. Well, obviously, if you're a fund, you've got like ten different portfolio managers, or you've got um, all the resources to be able to do that. But just uh, you know, and we're talking about individual investors. 
um, it's just going to lead to subpar returns. Um, you can't possibly keep track of 2030. I like to say, like, how many friends can you, how many friends can you um, stay in touch with and, and have like a grasp of like what they're up to? Like maybe like three to five friends, maybe 10 if you're like really social, like always going out. Like how are you going to manage 30 positions? Um, you know, like you just, it's just not going to happen. And so they do it because they feel good because they're like, oh, well, if some fail, it doesn't matter. Um, but when you look at the actual return where they can actually exit, um, yeah, returns are going to be subpar. The, re- the only reason someone would want to own 10, 20 coins is just a lack of process. It'd be like a guy trying to date like five girls at the same time. You, you date too many girls, you actually end up feeling nothing for any of them really because you just your brain just cannot handle that level of like like that depth. If you do, if you're investing in 10, 20 coins, you're probably doing that because you actually don't really like any of them. Like you don't even have conviction on any of them. If there was one coin that you really liked more than the others, you probably would want to own more of that one. You wouldn't want to own only 2% of your net worth in that coin. You'd probably want to have way more in it, right? Like people, they, they, they find, well, this is what people do, I find. They, they identify like 10, 20 coins that sound good on Twitter. They buy them. They forget they exist. They don't keep up to date with the thesis. They lose money. Now they're bag holding because it was just a VC pump and dump and they bought at the wrong time. They keep the coin because they're like, oh, I have to recover my losses. You know, I can't sell at a loss. And then they end up just holding this coin that they don't even believe in anymore. They've got no process, no conviction, and they just end up adding new coins to that existing pile and the pile just gets bigger. And it, it, by the end of the bull run, or during the bear market, it just becomes a pile of 30, 40 worthless coins that they don't even really care about. Well, I'll tell you what's even worse than that. What's even worse is um, out of those 30, one or two are going to do exceptional and they'll post on Twitter, I did 100x. But they'll sell those and then they'll fund their losers to um, <laughs> think it's like, oh, these other coins are going to go up later. So then they buy them, the bull market ends, and then they lose 95%. Um, and um, because they, they're not tracking each project, all they're tracking is... They just they open up their um, coin gecko or coin market cap and they just look at their total net worth dollar. They don't actually look at each individual project because they just can't manage it. And so you end up into this yeah, really bad cycle. Yeah. What do you think about that topic of like cutting losers versus um, like should you cut losers or should you cut winners? What do you think? No, you, you should never. Yeah. So um, you always <laughs> let your winners ride. Um, always let your winners ride. And um, I say cut losers, but I just want people to make sure that they're not mistaking that price being down necessarily just as a loser. It's got to be cut based on your thesis. So if you're following through your thesis and it's not tracking, you have an objective and independent piece of document or whatever it, you've stored it in. It says, okay, we have to cut because this is not tracking and, and I don't actually understand I don't understand the meta. I don't understand, um, you know, why it's behaving this way. And so you need to cut. Similarly, on the other end, um, if you have a winner um, in price and you're tracking along, that's great. But if it starts dramatically changing and it and it changes against your thesis or your thesis does hit, you also should be selling. And so, um, yeah, I, I just think that that's... Um, a crucial independent you need to create some kind of independent um um yeah independence from your portfolio so you can still stay objective Mm. because otherwise you'll just you'll just track with emotion exactly because in general life as a general like world life concept winners tend to continue to win and losers Mm -hmm. tend to continue to lose because a winner has a mindset which inevitably leads them to more winning and a loser has a mindset that inevitably has a mindset like they never they, their mindset inevitably leads them to more losing and when with crypto investing you obviously only want to pick winners but sometimes you pick what you think is a winner but they're actually a loser and when you when you realize that okay this is actually a loser who's probably going to continue to lose he doesn't have what i thought he had you then have to reallocate and you know and try to find another winner that's at least how i approach it yeah, and and and, um, and and it's just about how do you turn that into a process, and so um, that's why I think if if you have a thesis, then if it is a loser or you didn't understand it completely, you can then look back and go, well, what did I do wrong? Instead of otherwise, you don't learn anything, right? It's just like, oh, 
it's down, I, I'm going to sell it. But then you could go to the same mistake because then you just keep misinterpreting, you know, the same thing over and over. And I see this on Twitter all the time, like, oh, this X coin, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's it's focusing on this um, privacy narrative. Oh, privacy went down. So I'm going to focus on, you know, the DeFi narrative. <laughs> um, like they don't actually learn anything. Um, and the problem is that if you if you keep doing that, like no one is going to sit beside you and say, oh, you actually missed the fact that, you know, um, you actually have to think about, um, you know, usage or whatever other metrics, or it could be, um, you know, how many, um, you know, is this a fork? There's so many different things you have to think about. But unless you sit down and diagnose each situation, you'll just end up repeating the same mistake. Yep. All these dudes like messaging me this week, like, hey, bro, I see the price is going up. Like, should I buy now? Like, I feel like I'm going to miss the train. They're asking the wrong question. They're, instead of trying to fix the problem, they're trying to put a Band-Aid on it. It's like, if you accidentally cut yourself in the kitchen, don't ask like, like, oh my God, like, how do I, like, oh, I need to stop the bleeding. Like, yeah, maybe like stop the bleeding for a second. But the better question is like, how can you not cut yourself in the future? Because otherwise you're just going to open another cut every time you go to cook in the kitchen. Like, how are you going to not miss the bottom or like miss an entry. What was the flaw in your process? Fix that. And then that will uh, stop the problem from ever happening again. Because all these guys who ask like, should I buy now? They're not going to fix the root cause of the problem. It's like, imagine you have weeds in the garden and you don't pull the weed out from the root. You just pull the, the weed that you see above the ground. Like the, the weed is just going to grow back again. You didn't actually fix anything. Like that, it's just like the totally wrong approach to crypto. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and um, I know we're going to talk about this. I think, you know, the biggest or well, one of the biggest mistakes that um, newbie wannabe investors make is they think of investing as a outside in process. They think if I can just find the right pick, it's going to go up. I'm going to make money, but investing is really an inside out process. And I don't think you can separate investing with the person that you are. Um, and good investors, they tend to be almost stoic. Um, and I think stoicism is very, probably one of the best, I think, um, philosophies for like investor type people. Um, and so, yeah, it really starts with, am I prepared? Am I mentally prepared? Have I done um, the research? And then it's like an inside out process to then go, okay, what are my weaknesses and strengths? How am I going to apply those strengths? How do I cover my weaknesses? And then it's, you know, you're working outwards. But um, yeah, the biggest mistake is they work outside in. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. So by inside out, you mean inside is the strategy the mindset, the implementation, it's the things that you do and fixing your approach to crypto and then looking out and applying the process, the mindset, you know, the, the implementation to coins, which is the outside. Is that what you're trying to say? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are some other of the biggest problems that like the biggest flaws that people make on crypto Twitter, crypto YouTube? Like what are the biggest mistakes you see people making? Well, then, as you know, there's <laughs> like a billion. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, I think when we talk about it, um, and I, I don't know if you're going to talk or share about this later, because I know we both feel the same way about it, but I think like the ultimate lesson in uh, in investing is that you need to buy low, right? And then you need to sell high. And you've just got to spend all your time on thinking, like, how do I actually go about doing that? Um, but all the mistakes on Twitter, it's like something's gone up through, okay, should I buy now? Um, or, I, you know, someone else is holding this, and so I should buy that coin. It's like two people can hold exactly the same assets, and one can be... Um, you know, profit, you know, 10, 20 X, another person could lose 90%. So the, the actual pick itself doesn't induce the returns. Yep. Cause it's, every, it's the, it's the person 
like the pick is an ingredient, but the chef ultimately has to cook the dish. Because <laughs> every coin and, goes up in a bull run, you can technically so, make money on anything. Yeah, and, and look, and it necess- not my all, but then it's like, yeah, how are you going to implement it? Because the person that's going to implement it decides um, when they buy and when they sell. And so, um, and that's why this, there's this hate cycle on Twitter. Like there'll be influencers that promote something. It does a hundred X and the follower says, Oh, you're just trying to exit on me. Um, and, and they can't really psychologically come to the conclusion that they, and they don't realize that the pick itself is, is not what decided the returns. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think it, yeah, that's fundamental, but like, there's just too many mistakes. <laughs> there's a lot of mistakes. I'm trying to think, there's so many that I can't think of any, but I, I have thought of one, one of the big, and I struggled with this one as well. And it relates to the picks thing. You go on crypto Twitter and you try to find accounts, which are really smart and that are talking about particular coins that can do well in the bull run. And you try to find the best account that finds the best coins that can that is the most accurate. And the problem is, if you find a coin and it's talked about on crypto Twitter enough times, like 99% of those coins are actually not good. They're just good for a brief period of time. And your entry and the guy who's shilling its entry can be entirely different. And he can make money and you can lose money on the same coin and it can be good for him and bad for you. And using crypto Twitter as your vehicle for finding these coins is not effective because by the time that you get your entry from after they talk about it, it's generally too late because people talk about the coin the most that's going up, right? The guy that's talking nonstop about Solana is the guy, it's because that's the coin that's gone up in his portfolio. So by the time you see it everywhere on Twitter, it was the outlier that went up the most. And then you're probably just going to end up becoming exit liquidity because most of these guys talking about coins on Twitter are paid to shill or they're a part of the team. For example, Hydra, I don't know if you saw that one. They basically just got a bunch of um, influencers to support the coin and they just got, gave them an allocation. And the team of advisors looks really good because it's all these people from you know crypto Twitter on the team, but they're not actually on the team. They're sort of just inside... Uh, they're just sort of like paid to be the front the front page advertisers and they just end up exiting on you know other people and that's like what a lot of these crypto twitter coins are like you, you see all these coins talked about it's just the guy was sponsored the coin's going well he talks about it because it's going well you see it you think that because everyone's talking about it it's good you buy it but you're actually just exit liquidity exactly and i think there's two parts of that one is what smart people do at the start dumb people do at the end um, which is, um, you know, a big thing. And then the separate thing of, you know, people always say like, everything is just hype. So why does it matter? Like, isn't that how you should um, play if, if hype is what takes the price up? But the reason why you need to separate that is, is to exactly figure out like, is this hype or not? Like if your strategy is that I'm going to um, get in early on hype cycles, take a quick, you know, long and get out the problem is people confuse investing trading they don't know what the fundamentals are they don't know if it is a high play is it a fundamental play is it a combination like you have to be very detailed as to what it is you're doing and so um so then what ends up happening is everyone just ends up becoming in rotating from consensus to consensus and nothing produces um worse returns than um doing what the average does Mm -hmm. What do you think of like, what do you think of using, like, what do you think of the concept of outsourcing your decision making? Do you believe there's any level that you can sort of like maybe copy is a word, copy people from crypto Twitter? Or do you personally like do everything yourself, like personally make up your entire thesis yourself, pick your coins yourself, whatever? Like, do you have any level of outsourcing? When you're doing research, you're obviously. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, when you're doing research, obviously you're going to read other people's content and things like that. So I structure my Twitter feed with people that I don't agree with as well as people I do agree with so that as time goes on, I make sure that I'm not curating my feed to just feed my bias. And it's a big problem in in the world today with news, like on Facebook or anything. Like if you watch something, only things that 
are similar to that get shown. And so your sense of reality gets continues to get warped. So you've always got to think about how do I create a news flow or information flow that allows me to get um, both sides and don't play the game of, oh, you're just angry this coin's up or, you know, your thing because the coin's down. Like, don't get into that because once you start playing that game, you just get tied up with with everyone else and then you end up letting your emotions get the worst of you at the be- at the worst time. Mm-hmm. What are you going to be looking out for uh, in your process for your exit? Is there any data sets that you look at? Is there like, how are you going to approach the exit towards the end of the bull run? Is there any like mindsets or like sort of strategies? Yeah. So I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a bit biased in the sense of, you know, on entry, you do need to think about um, time horizons. And um, for me personally, you have positions that could be like Bitcoin and ETH that originally when you enter that you actually have decade long um, thesis. And as long as that thesis tracked, um, you would hold on because you're looking for exponential linear returns, not step up logarithmic, which is tends to what happens if you try to always buy and sell on, mm-hmm. on, on short term horizons. Um, but as far as olds go, um, when you start to see things going exponential, um, in alts, when you start seeing Rolexes and Ferraris on the timeline, I wouldn't completely exit, but like a good way to do that is like you can then DCA your alts back into Bitcoin because even if Bitcoin drops, you're always going to be um, up more in, in, in um, Bitcoin and ETH at the end of the bull market than you are if you're holding alts. And so like that's a good example of like not a perfect exit, but still going to get a much better exit um, over time than if you... Um, you know, then if you're just trying to play um, this, uh, I, I must try to figure out how to sell at all time high. Um, and obviously, there's a, many other things that go into it. Um, but yeah, I think for followers uh, and people that view this, it's really important that they come up with their own strategy. Because if they, the funny thing about exits is if you try to copy other people's strategy, what you'll end up copying is consensus on Twitter, and then it's not going to happen. So, um, Having a good strategy, um, sorry, having a, you know an, an excellent strategy with decent execution is much better um, than um, trying to attempt um, the other way around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't need to be perfect. Trying to be perfect will end up losing you more because if you're investing over a 60-year time period, you're going to have to perform the same system, the same buy and sell like many, many times. And a good execution will allow you to consistently do well over time versus trying to be perfect. And you, you're just going to end up fucking it up. You might be right like a few times, but all the times you were wrong will lose you more than any perfect execution could make you. Exactly. I mean, and the game of building wealth is how do I build wealth over time? It's not me in 10 years showing you a photo of how much I used to have this one day 10 years ago. <laughs> And so if you actually think about like what is wisdom, wisdom is the ability to see the the long-term outcomes of short-term decisions. And so when you really think about wealth, how are you going to pass on wealth to kids? How are you going to make money? How are you going to still have money when you're 50, 60, 70, 80 years old? It's like, okay, you know what? It's not going to be possible if I rely on gambling and, and try to think of this as a lottery. Um, like I actually need to build a process that's going to allow me to invest across time, across markets. Um, and so if you're serious about investing, then you, you come to that, um, that conclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, and and yeah. the sad reality is that most people watching this aren't and will never be investors. They will just perpetually stay as gamblers. Like I run groups that teach crypto. And the sad thing is a lot of people still get dopamine rushes from like, degen related bets like we'll talk about like there'll be conversation about some sort of degen bet and then i'll feel in the chat like people go oh degen bet oh yeah i can feel that like certain people really love when you talk about the 100x coins like i'll do a video for engagement the 100x coin and the people who love the 100x coins are always the ones without money and you have to ask yourself why do people who love 100x coins not have money 
Is it because they need the hundred X to get rich or is it because they have a type of person who wouldn't ever have money? Which way is it? It's generally the second way. They want, they, they exactly. don't have money because yeah. they're chasing the hundred X, not because they don't have money and they're chasing the hundred X. Exactly. It's because they could make a hundred X, but then tomorrow they could lose it all as well. So over time, you have to multiply the probability of your decisions across a 20 year period. And the answer to those people is it's always zero. So, um, you know, that's, that's a big problem. And actually, I just want to touch on the other, you know, biggest kind of, um, you know, mental problem that the people have. And it's, it's when they put in money, like the market is, is, you know, um, moving now, but you see so many people say, but the economy is so bad and, you know, <laughs> everything is going to the, everything is going to the crapper. And so how could you possibly, there is a difference between um, reality and financial markets because financial markets are always looking out 12 to 18 months. And so the worst time in the economy is the best time to invest. And when employment is rosy, everything's looking great. Um, that's the worst time to put in money. And so, um, you combine that bias of investing when it's rosy, looking for 100x, chasing winners, it's it's impossible to make money that way. Mm -hmm. That concept you just said with the times in your system's hit rate by 20 years is so valuable. That's, that's a really good hack that people can take. Look at your approach, come up with a probability of how many people succeeded in this, like how, what's your success rate of hitting this, Times that by the 20 year time frame of you doing it. And then you'll find out the math of how you actually never make money because you win so little times and you lose so much that it just counteracts any home run gain that you could have made. Like that's such a good approach, like such a good like mindset hack. Exactly. And, and people look at Twitter. Exactly. And people look at Twitter, they see that one guy that made like nine figures. It's not actually, if, if you have a hundred guys with seven figures, then one or two guys just playing on leverage, just out of shit, good timing can make nine figures or eight figures in a cycle because they've put all their eggs into one basket and they've leveraged long on 10X and they've just managed to go up. But then as soon as the bear turns, they lose everything. So you see so many people on Twitter that grew their accounts to eight, nine figures and now they don't even have, you know, seven figures. So mm -hmm. so you, you, if you don't think about the, the long-term um, game of wealth, then you're going to end up gambling. Because so. certain strategies work really well in certain markets and really bad in other markets. And your ability to adjust that strategy, depending on what the market environment is, will, will dictate you know if you end up keeping that money or losing it. Like the guy who runs up a bag in the bull run, wor it worked because he was super risk on during the period where it was time to be risk on. And where he went wrong was he didn't adjust his strategy to account for where the market cycle was. He kept being the degen after the market had topped. He didn't listen to what the market was telling him and, and you know, maybe just stop playing the game. This is another big thing that I, I talk to people about. It's crypto is essentially a casino of sorts. And when you've hit the home run in the casino, the worst thing that you can do is keep playing. Like all these people, they make money in a bull run. And their system never has a thing that says stop playing. They don't have a stop playing game. Like they don't, they don't, they never know when to turn off the game. Like in crypto, obviously you don't want to just approach it purely as a gambler, but there's a time to invest and there's a time to take off risk and, and relax and just sit back and you don't have to do anything. Like if there was a one year period where you had zero crypto exposure and you just sat back because the, everything was going too airy fairy, rosy, good time, and you just chilled because you didn't see any great opportunities, that would be an amazing decision, but no one does that. I would say less than 0.1% of people could take a one year hiatus from crypto with zero exposure just to let things chill because you can see that the market's overextended. But it's that sort of approach which would actually make you way more money if you, if you had the ability to just take a year off and just do nothing. Because you don't, you don't always have to be invested. You don't always have to be doing things. You don't always have to be risk on. Exactly. And so, you know, there's so many different things we can talk about of how would you rebalance and, you know, there's a hundred different lessons to learn. Um, don't, don't try to, um, 
don't try to chase. But that's why it all comes back down to you think about, okay, what is the game of growing wealth? How do you buy low and sell high and really think through that? And then you combine that with, okay, I'm the chef. What is in my mind that's psychologically holding me back or um, what am I thinking about the markets wrong? And, and, and you just got to be a problem solver and you've got to work inside out one of those issues at a time so that you can and, and nut that out. So it's, it's really, you've got to focus on the specifics instead of just the, um, the, um, the, um, like, you know, general um, things of, you know, finding peaks and stuff. But it takes a lot of, if, if you're wise, you can learn that quicker. If you're not, it takes longer. But ultimately, that's the final lesson, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And you talk a lot about comfy holds versus um, uncomfortable holds. Um, I find that a, right. an interesting concept and it was actually something I learned from you on your Twitter. You say, comfy holds are the worst performers as it means it's yet to test the conviction of its holders. I love I love that. I, I can completely agree with that. I'd, I'd love for you to expand on the concept yeah. of like comfy holders and, you know, like what is a good hold? What is a bad hold? Yeah. And I, and I don't want people to get too tied into the semantics. They'll be like, oh, well, I was comfy in this and it dropped 70%. I'm just saying that in general, when people say, <laughs> oh, this is, a, um, this is a comfy hold, they think everything's looking good. Um, there's nothing to worry about. It means that I don't need to check if there's progress because it's just going up, which ultimately triggers the fact that they don't have, um, they don't have a written thesis. They don't, um, know what could go wrong. And so anyone, you know, that it's going to go wrong when everyone is only thinking about the upside and not the downside. Whereas if you're, um, I mean, you should still have conviction and I wouldn't say what goes up is necessarily um, use the word uncomfortable, but it should, it should, you know, when you do buy the position, you should feel a little bit sick in the stomach. Yeah. Um, and, um, because all the returns happen when depressed prices swings from fear to greed and then people chase and that shift from fear to greed and those buyers that come in is what creates the higher prices. And so if you're comfy, it means you've swung on the speculum, you're at the green side, and you're just about to become exit liquidity. And I'd like for everyone to think the next time they think their bag's comfy and they think, you know, this is the one, see what happens after six months. Did, did something that, you know, is your smallest position that you felt sick about actually the thing that outperformed? And um, for me personally, it's always been like that. So mm-hmm. I guess you have to think about how strong is the type of buyer that now owns your coin? Because regardless of where you are in the market, there will always be a test of the holder base. There's always a test to see how strong that holder base is. And it's like good times create weak men, weak men create bad times, that concept. When where, when the coin has been completely fucked with, like for example, Solana, FTX crash, everyone hates Solana. They think it's a scam. The holder base was tested Anyone who now holds Solana cannot be fudded out of their bag. There is no more news that could come out which could make them sell because everyone, the weak people have gone. And it's like that statement, weak times, uh, strong times create bad or whatever it was. But like the way it comes around is that the strong men create good times, right? The strong holders create upward performance because no one is left to sell if if everyone has been tested. And as the, as you go into the greed cycle, you now get the weak hands entering. You get the pussies. You get the people who don't have conviction, don't have a thesis. They they sell low. They they don't they they swap between different coins. You start getting the tourists into your coin. And that's when you need to be concerned because now you know that if there was ever something bad to come out in terms of the news or the macro, there's a lot of people who now would not pass the test of being able to hold a position. They would sell. Exactly. Yeah. And, and and that's why you should, but also that's why you shouldn't chase. And then if, if all, if you just follow the right rules and you bought low and it dropped, you'd still be up. So you're okay. But the guys that chased, um, you get crucified. And so, um, yeah, if, if people can come back to those basics of, you know, having wisdom about long-term wealth and about buying low, buying, uh, you know, uh, buying low and selling high, 
and applying those every time they get too excited or chasing, oh, this position's just comfy. Um, yeah, everyone would do much better. Well, th- there's two types of pains in crypto, right? You either have the pain of buying when it hurts or the pain of buying when it feels good, but you feel the pain of losing money, right? There's, there's only two possible pains. What do you prefer? Painfully exactly. buying? Well, I, 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 <laughs> mate, that's so true. I, I like to say if, it, if it's... Um, <laughs> You, it can either feel um, painful at the start and it'll feel good in the end, or if it feels good to buy, you're going to feel the pain later. So it's up to you which way you want to do it. <laughs> you got to feel pain either way. You may as well feel the pain up front. Get it out of the way. Yeah, feel all the pain up front. Exactly. Mm-hmm. All right. I think there was one more tweet that you did. Yeah. You talk about every financial lesson just boils down to the simple concept of Buy, buy a capitulation, buy low, and then sell high. That's like what it all boils down to. And that's what my investment system basically does. It's just like buy low, buy capitulation-ish, sell high. Like how did you like how do you like maybe break that statement down a bit more and like like how are you like how are you picking like when to buy low? What do you look for? It, it, like when when I asked you this question for when to sell, there wasn't too much specifics besides um basically looking for like hysteria, mass hysteria, Uber driver talking about it. Is there something that you look for well, on, on your Twitter and, and feed? It's, it's, it's got to be written in your, it's got to be written in your thesis. Yeah. Yeah. What, do you have, what is your thesis for, for buying low? Is there anything that you look out for in your, in your process? Like, for example, do you have certain crypto Twitter accounts that you use as like a counter trade signal? Do you use a particular data set? Is it more a hunch? Is it like a pattern recognition? You just know? Like, how would you say? How would you say you know when to buy with your process? Yeah, well, the, and this is key. And the, the key thing is that you don't know, right? And so you have mm-hmm. to, like I said at the start, you have to wish, you have to be confident, but you also have to assume you could be wrong. And so um, when you apply that, you just have to keep thinking through. Okay, well, how is it practically applied? And so, for, for example, with Bitcoin, it, when Bitcoin was at you know, 20 grand, you have to think, okay, it can go 20, 30% lower, but in the long run, um, is Bitcoin dead or is, is, or do you actually believe that Bitcoin at some point in the next two to three years is going to be above, um, uh, 20 grand? And, and so if that's the case, then why are you not even starting to buy? Right. Um, and what is the cost of you missing it and it going higher? Like, do you lose? the asymmetric upside in that opportunity. Um, and, you know, are you going to miss um, a 10, 20 X because you want a 10% cheaper? So you have to really talk to yourself and be realistic and coming back to, you know, um, you know, um, having a, a good execution. It doesn't have to be, um, doesn't have to be perfect, you know, 100% perfect. If you just have to have good execution and, and people are going to say, well, you, yeah, it's easy to say buy low, sell high, but it's not like you can always pick winners. And that's true. <laughs> many, many, many times you can buy low and it's still going to go lower. Right. But that's why you have sizing. That's why you have a portfolio. That's why you um, allocate more to Bitcoin. That's why, um, it's important that you size your old positions equally at the same percentage across a few positions so that even if two or three um, do nothing, it only takes one to create order of magnitudes um, um, uh, of return. And so that's why I, I say things like actually your small positions um, should be your bigger positions um, in terms of your um, oh, it's not not large market cap because um, yeah, people think like, oh, this small cap, I'm going to put in, um, you know, X thousand, but this big, large market cap, I'm going to put in, you know, 40,000. Well, actually, you haven't spread your risk. You own five tokens, but if just one goes down, you lose all your money. And so you need to, like, people don't really think about that. Whereas if you had four positions, equal weight dollars that you've put in, then even if one goes to zero, um, another one of equal size that does a 10X is going to more than cover that position and the others. And so if you look at most people's positions, though, they don't. It's like their first position is like 
x, second position is x minus 2, then x minus 3, and it's kind of this reverse triangle down. Then really, unless your top one, two positions do well, it really doesn't matter what happens with the rest of your positions. And so um, they, they haven't thought about that. And so, um, and I'm, I'm talking about the old positions, by the way, separate to the 70% Bitcoin ETH that I talked about. But yeah. Um, yeah. And often the altcoin that they are most bullish on, that they have the most money in, is the one that performs the worst because they just basically uh, went on crypto Twitter and they found a exactly. it's a consensus position. Exactly. Yeah. And they, the, and the, the, the consensus they bet they allocate the, the most to. Exactly. Absolutely. Mm. So, and your concept of basically like spread betting of sorts, like have a few coins, equal weighting. One of them, 100Xs, is cool because if, you know, if one of them dies, it's fine because there's, you know, you're hoping that one of them outperforms the rest. That concept works with a small basket because you have the mental capacity to handle four altcoins. This wouldn't work like we were talking about with the 20. Just for clarity, like if someone did 20 coins using the same mindset, it wouldn't work because you just don't have the mental capacity to the mental bandwidth to spread it across 20 coins. And then each win on a 20 coin bet has to do a lot more to cover the others. And so then what ends up happening is you buy second best, third best um, options. You start buying random things. And so, yeah, I, I just can't stress enough how important it is to really think through every single scenario. So, um, and this is different to everyone, everyone. But for me personally, for example, when, when I say, like 70% in Bitcoin split, 70, 30. It's like, well, why is it? Why, why, why do I personally do it like that? Well, people say the beta on ETH is um, like, let's say 2X Bitcoin, right? So my assumption is for some reason, if Bitcoin died um, and, and um, ETH did a 2, 3X, then that covers my loss if Bitcoin went to zero. Now I'm using extreme examples, but that level of thought process gives me the ability to be calm when the market is turbulent. Whereas if you haven't thought about it, all you're thinking about is, oh no, I'm losing money. Like this is the end. And even if it is, it is the end and it, everything was down, but I'm thinking, well, I've still got my gold positions in my retirement account because if all of crypto fails, we still need a store of value. So what would that be? So like you have to wrestle with your demons because if you don't, the market is a silent psychologist and it knows all your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be like, mm. Imagine if you could go back in time to January and see that, or imagine if you could go back in time to when you entered a position and you saw that it went down 20% and then went up 200%. You wouldn't, you would no longer care about the 20% because you know the inevitable outcome was 200%. That's what thinking about every possible scenario does. If you have considered the scenario, it's almost the same as if you'd gone back in time and you, you knew what was going to happen because you, you've exactly. mentally accounted for that situation. So if it happens, you're not surprised anymore. Exactly. Exactly. And, and um, so th that's why um, you need to think this through because, um, and, and I think this is really poignant about the market being a silent psychologist. If you haven't worked out your own issues, the market's going to figure it out for you. They're going to do everything they can. They're going to, like I said, go sideways. They're going to go up and down. They're going to go, around to try to figure out, okay, what is psychologically wrong with Dan, with Kuhn? What, what freaks them out? And inevitably, you're going to get tested. And so ultimately, you get the returns that you deserve because, you know, someone might historically have a higher all-time high or whatever, but the money that's actually exited that you make was earned based on your ability to um, actually um, execute the whole process. It's not just a point in time. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the concept? This might be the last question because we've been going for a, quite a long time, which is good. This has been really good. But what do you, uh, what do you think of the, the statement, it's not a loss until you sell? Because I know you're going to have a nuanced answer here, so I'd like to hear it. It's not a loss until you sell. Um. <laughs> Yeah, because like imagine someone I mean, someone's lost fifty yeah. percent and they're like, I haven't lost money because I haven't sold. Yeah, well, well, I think it, it comes back to all these things of 
it's not the absence um, of losers. So first of all, you shouldn't be scared of um, losing, um, firstly. And then you have to also consider, is it volatility or is this temporary uh, or is this permanent? Like, is this, are we talking, um, you know, are we talking um, every member of the team has quit, um, the government <laughs> has banned, um, or are we talking um, volatility um, based on, you know, one one um, account market selling their position. So you you so you really have to think about that, and then you have to think about is it still um, following uh, my thesis? Um, and so with all these platitudes, you really need to then go back to first principles thinking, and then think about the specifics. Um, and so the 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 big platitude at the top of the wall says buy low, sell high, and then. You've got to work your way down into the specifics until you get to the very bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very yeah. good insight. So, Do you have any, any final thoughts or anything you wanted to cover? Um, anything that you think the viewers would like to hear um, before we wrap it up? Because I see we've gone for, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half, I think, which has been really good. Um, if you had any final thoughts, and I'm going to bring up your Twitter as well to show people. Mate, yeah, this has been great. And I know between you and I, we could chat all day um, because there's just, you know, so many things. But yeah, I'd really like people to take away that you can't separate being a good investor with the human that you are. So if you want to be a good investor, you need to work on your mind. You have to become calm. Um, your highs and lows as a human being have to be lower if you're also going to be able to deal with the volatility in the market. Um, and so you really have to know yourself well. And so the better you know yourself um, and how you deal with situations allows you to then create a process that deals with your weaknesses in the market. Otherwise, the market is going to find those weaknesses. And so, um, and, and I say this particular thing because everyone always focusing on big. So, um, yeah, focus, focus on yourself and, and think outward as opposed to the other way around. Because mm -hmm. the market will inevitably expose every flaw. For you to make money, every flaw will be exposed. So you either bring it out early or you let the market bring it out for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate uh, you coming on this. This has been really, really good. We clearly have similar approaches, but you take things to another level, which is amazing. And I've just got on the screen, you don't see it, but everyone watching, you can see uh, his Twitter account. I recommend you follow him. He's when he does tweet, they're very, very good. Sometimes he takes breaks, you know, clearly just focused on living. Um, but he tweets amazing stuff. Very, very good insights into actually doing crypto properly. Uh, I think this is the only place people can find you, correct? Just your Twitter account? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, you guys should all give him a follow. Definitely worthwhile. And, yeah, thank you guys for all joining. Um, if you guys like this video, leave a comment below. I want to hear your feedback. We might do a part two if, if you guys like it enough. We'll see. Now, if you've watched to the end of this video, I want to say thank you. And I wanted to leave a little message for you. If you've watched this far, you probably realize that you've made a lot of mistakes investing. There's a lot of things missing in your process, in the way that you approach investing, and you need to fix this in order to make a lot of money this bull run. If you want the strategies, if you want the processes, the mindset, the further teachings, if you want to know exactly when you should be buying and when you should be selling, everything that basically we were talking about in this video, but in an implementable, practical fashion, then you should be inside of my mastermind. Everything that we talked about today are lessons and mistakes that we've learned firsthand from investing, which we've now fixed. And we now teach the process that doesn't have any of the mistakes that most people have been making, right? You can implement today the strategy, the process of people who have made all the mistakes already. You don't need to make all the mistakes and the errors that we talked about in this video. You can just today implement the correct strategy to buy low, sell high, pick the right coins, even though that's not that important, and be able to make money as a crypto investor properly. So if you want to do this, I run a mastermind community. I have five people I let on every single month. If you want to join, there's an application link below. Hopefully I'll see you guys inside. Cheers.